as our Washington Nationals have hit a little bit of a rough road lately, losing their last five games and falling to 3-13 and in the month of June, the Washington Nationals just had their biggest win of the season, and it came off the field. You are Locked On Nationals, your daily Washington Nationals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed with our friends at Game Time. And thank you guys for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every day, as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast. For the everydayers out there, you know who I am. I'm Ryan Clary. You can find me over on Twitter at Ryan Clary Eleven. That you see over on YouTube as well. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network where you get your team every single day, and that is for any team out there. Later on in the show, we're going to discuss this Cardinals National Series and really get into this game, Game 3 today, if it's going to happen. As we do know, it is pouring rain in the nation's capital, so will this game get in? Who knows? I'll be here to preview here for that game because... We'll just act like it's going to happen. And we're also going to break down last night's loss and just get into the Cardinals series as a whole. As I've talked about, this is my World Series. I want to beat the Cardinals every single day. So we're going to discuss plenty of this Cardinals National Series. As the Nationals, they got to win today, plain and simple. But speaking of wins, the biggest win of the 2023 season for this Washington Nationals team was going to be coming from off the field, and we got delivered with that yesterday as Chelsea Janes and Benjamin Strauss from the Washington Post reported that the Nationals and the Orioles have reached a $100 million agreement on past Masson payments. And this covers the years from 2012 to 2016. For people who don't really know about this, let me catch you up real quick. The Nationals and the Orioles have been battling this out in court for past a decade at this point. The Orioles own the Mid-Atlantic Sports Network. The Nationals only own about 25% of that, and that is a very rough estimate, as we have said. This deal is a huge deal as to why the Nationals haven't really been spending as much money, haven't really been earning as much money as well. And it is because of the Orioles keep on going into this, dipping into their back pocket, going to court, and really just trying to screw over the Nationals in every which way about this. But this time, the Nationals, once again, have won in court. They have got that $100 million agreement with the Orioles, and they now have their money that was owed from them all the way from 2012, the first NL postseason appearance of this Nationals team, all the way through 2016. The Nationals have got their money now. There is nothing that we can say about this. And this is huge news because there are plenty of reasons and plenty of different avenues to go about this. One, we all know that the learners, they have put this up, this national team, this huge asset, this multi-billion dollar asset of theirs up for sale. That got paused over the winter because you may ask, the Mid-Atlantic Sports Network. That is why this national sale has been off to a terrible start. It's because the team is not valuated at its appropriate price because they haven't had the money and they don't have the assets of this TV deal to really make this pro baseball team in a huge major market worthwhile. You look at teams like the Dodgers. The Dodgers and why they are so rich, one, they have great ownership, and two, they have one of the best TV deals in all of sports. I can't break that down for you, but I just know you can look it up yourselves. They earn a ton of revenue from this. But the most important part of this mass and debacle that has been over a decade now, we've all complained about it. We've all been tired of it. But this now opens up the door for the Lerner family to sell the Washington Nationals. That is number one. And while myself, I'm not the 
biggest hater of the Lerner family. I know a lot of Nationals fans out there have really just turned on the Lerner family, and that's your decision to make, but that's not mine. I think the Lerner family have been relatively really good owners. They've done what they can. They spent when they had to. Over the last few years, yeah, they haven't spent. But also when you get or when you have $100 million that you were owed from previous years, like 2012 all the way through 2016, and oh, not to mention, they still have to figure out the next court date from the 2017 all the way through 2021 that they'll have to figure out and come up with that number. But I can tell you this, it's not going to be the $100 million amount that they just got from that 2012 through 2016 period. It will not be that. You may ask why, and that is because since the pandemic and really before the pandemic as well, subscribers have really dropped off when it comes to massing. It's the cord cutting people, the people who are getting rid of cable and going to streaming. Masson doesn't really have that option. You have to have cable. And so they've lost a couple million subscribers to that Masson channel, which obviously means less eyeballs on it. And when there's less eyeballs on it, that means there's less money. So who knows what the amount will be that they get. But if I had to bet, it would probably be around 75 million that they're going to be getting from that 2017 through 2021. It's going to be much less money than $100 million. That is all I know. But still. The millions of dollars that this organization and the Lerner family and specifically is owed by the Orioles and Masson, they are now getting that money. And this is a huge deal for all accounts. Because as I said, the Learners, this is what has held them back from selling this team. And as fans and as media members, as whatever you want to account for, this is a huge deal. A huge deal. Because we all know that Ted Leonsis is in the hunt right now for this national team. No one really knows it publicly, but it's been well stated that he will be the next Nationals owner if this mass and mess rings through. But also about this, a lot of people have used the mass and debacle as an excuse for the learner money, including myself, to not really spend in free agency. And it is a very valid point because, you know, this national team is worth roughly $2 billion, probably a little bit more. And we've heard that Leonce has even offered a tad more than that $2 billion number. But here's the thing. That excuse is no more with the learners not spending the money because of the mass and deal. I've used it in the past. I've used that excuse plenty of times and said, well, I'm human. I get this. They are owed money. They don't have that money. Therefore, they haven't really spent the amount of money that they probably could have over the years. Now, was $100 million going to change anything? Probably nothing drastic. But still, it gives them extra money in their wallet, money that they are owed. It's simple to me. And so you look at this from the outside in, you're like, okay, $100 million, what is that going to do? Buy you another three-year $100 million deal with a pitcher? Meh, maybe. It still helps nonetheless. The $100 million is what they were owed. And also, by the way, they got more money coming in from whatever that is. Because every five years, Masson, the Orioles, and the Nationals come together to figure out what money they are owed. And the Nationals have felt for years that they have been cut short of the money that they are directly owed by Masson and the Orioles. So now as this gets a little bit less and less tension, whatever you want to say about this between the Nationals and the Orioles, the more it bodes well for the Nationals, their fans, and the Lerner family to do what they want to do. Because if they do want to sell this team, they now have that door open. Because this is my gut feeling, is that not only does this open up the sale for the Nationals and to the Learners to sell this team, to do what they want to do with it, whatever it may be, but it also opens up the possibility for the Nationals to jump ship from this mass and mess and join NBC Sports Washington or Monumental Sports, whatever it's called now. That's what it opens up for me. That is the biggest deal of this. And oh, by the way, those networks are owned by Ted Leonsis, the owner of the Washington Capitals, and as well as the Washington Wizards. Plenty of people have their opinions on Ted Leonsis. I'll leave that out for now. But this is huge. This is the biggest win of the 2023 season, and it isn't even close. This national team is in a rebuild. The expectation is not for them to win 90 games. 
But my expectation for this year was I wanted to have this mass and mess and this ownership mess solved at some point. And yesterday was the biggest step possible for that to happen in 2023. Because as we've said, there's three different avenues that could come from this. It opens the door for the Lerner family to sell the Nationals. Two, it also gets rid of the excuse as to why the Learners haven't really spent as much money as they probably should be, being in a huge top 10 market in America. And three, it could and should open up the door for the Nationals and their new ownership to jump ship and to go into another network wherever that is, wherever it may be. So yesterday was a huge win nonetheless. And again, I'll say it again. It opens up the door for many different avenues that could be coming down our way. And you know that over on Locked On Nationals, right here, right now, I'll have you covered every step of the way for this mass and mess and this ownership mess, whatever it may be. I got you covered here on Locked On Nationals. And, of course, you guys can catch the Nationals play the Cardinals today at 4.05 Eastern time and catch every pitch in the Nats' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. Before we get into talking about the Cardinals series, we're going to discuss Mackenzie Gore's start yesterday and much, much more as we break that down. But before we do that, let me tell you guys about our friends over at Game Time. And, guys, Buying tickets to your favorite event should not be stressful. That's why game time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guaranteed, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you'll have. There are flash deals and last-minute tickets and easy-to-find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. And there's also my favorite factor, the images of your seat view, so you can see if there's an obstructed view or whatever it may be, you get to see where you're sitting and picture yourself drinking a beer, eating a hot dog, whatever it is at a base baseball game or really any event in town. And that's why my friends at Game Time have you covered. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again. Create an account and redeem code locked on MLB for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, always guaranteed. And now we get back into it as the Nationals did lose yesterday of a score of nine to three against the St. Louis Cardinals. And as I've said plenty of different times, this is a series that I so desperately want to win. So desperately want to win. Every time it comes up on this calendar, and especially when it's at home against the home crowd and all the different factors at Nationals Park. Mackenzie Gore started yesterday, did not have his best stuff. And again, this was a really tough matchup for the kid, a really tough one. Because when you have a loaded righty lineup with Dylan Carlson, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, Wilson Contreras, All these different guys who, oh, and Jordan Walker, by the way. All these different right-handed bats that Mackenzie Gore as a lefty is going to have to face. We knew that this was going to be a very tough matchup for him. And the Cardinals, they took advantage of him. The 24-year-old did not have his ace up yesterday. And that was clearly evident of the fact he gave up nine hits in those six-inning pitch. He had five earned runs. He gave up two home runs. But the bright side, he had eight white, uh, eight, eight strikeouts and two walks. Not the best scenario. But again, six innings pitch, eight strikeouts. This was the thing with yesterday. Gore just didn't have his A stuff. Simple as that. And it's going to happen when you have a young 24-year-old starting pitcher. This guy's got a lot to deal with on a day-in and day-out basis. He's one of the Nationals' best pitchers. He's been one of the brightest spots on this team so far this season. But you're starting to see him go through this tough stretch. And if you remember last year with the Padres, this was kind of when he hit a rough stretch as well with them. This is what's going to happen with young pitchers. It's never going to be this fun amusement ride that's going straight downhill, and it's never going to stop. We got lost in that factor back with Steven Strasburg in 2010 when it was just a smooth sailing parade and whatever you want to call it. 
but that's not really reality. That's not really how these guys interpret a season. It's not really how young pitchers go with it. Check out Max Scherzer's number or Clayton Kershaw's. All these different pitchers who have struggled at the early part of their career. Just because one day it was sunshine and rainbows doesn't mean the next day it will be as well. Like the nation's capital today. It's pouring raining after a beautiful day yesterday. The ups and the downs of this season with a young team is necessary. It's going to happen. And it will continue to happen. So a lot of people who may be a little bit down on Mackenzie Gore from that start. Don't be. Don't be whatsoever. Mackenzie Gore, he had this coming. When you're going up against all those all-star right-handed hitters who do a ton of damage. Jordan Walker, a young 20-year-old or 21, whatever he is, come up right-handed bat against a left-handed pitcher who throws a lot of sliders, and it can be difficult for those right-handed batters to hit. But if you don't have your ace up that day, you can get taken advantage of. And that's what happened with Mackenzie Gore yesterday as he gave up nine hits, five earned, and only two, or not only, he up two home runs, both of them to Dylan Carlson. It wasn't the best of days for him, and that's fine. It's going to happen. It's going to happen again and again and again. That's because this is what it's like for a young starting pitcher. It's never going to be sunshine and rainbows. It never was going to be that from day one. He's hit a rough road just like this Nationals team, and that's what happens in a rebuild. That wasn't the only thing that happened yesterday. We do like to talk about Mackenzie Gore on this show because obviously he's been a great bright spot for this team. But the Nationals offense, they got wiped out from Jordan Montgomery. Plain and simple. Jordan Montgomery, another left-handed bat. And as we've talked about, I like the lefty-righty situations on this baseball team because you have guys like J. Mayor Candelario, Lane Thomas, Name that right-handed bat, Joey Manessis. Those are the right-handed bats that we really count on going into a lefty matchup like we had yesterday with Montgomery. And that just wasn't the case yesterday. The Nationals offense got held to eight hits in total. Montgomery did really well for his one of his best starts of the season, in my opinion, only giving up four hits in seven full innings. He had six strikeouts. He only walked one batter, and he only had one earned run. Now, here's the thing. This Nationals lineup, we've talked about the struggles of what they have done so far. You go one for seven with runners in scoring position yesterday. That's the part where you find yourself in trouble. This Nationals team, as we've talked about, it doesn't have the slugging metrics of what we want them to have. You don't really have the home run threat. You don't really have the extra base threat anymore outside of Lane Thomas. But the good thing, as we saw yesterday, was someone like a Luis Garcia going one for four at the triple. But even then, that ball was so poorly played in the outfield, and someone needs to tell me how Dylan Carlson was playing in that right field spot, and it was just a weird one because it looked like a routine fly ball. But then what happened? What happened there? He just was playing, it seemed like, 250 feet in. It was so weird. But nonetheless, that wasn't even the biggest headline of yesterday. Obviously, we all saw the Victor Robles, Mackenzie Gore, little spat in the dugout. What do I think of it? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you shouldn't either. Whose fault is it? Who should? Who's to blame? Who do we blame? Is it Victor Robles' fault? No. It's not Mackenzie Gore's fault. It's not Victor Robles' fault. It's not Davey Martinez's fault. But here's also another factor of this. If you saw this yesterday, Victor Robles hit a ball to the wall, and he only got a single out of that. You also saw him kind of a little gimpy going out to center field. Victor Robles is not 100%, and he's even acknowledged this. And we're starting to see on the field as to why he didn't catch that routine fly ball in the center field as to why he didn't make it to second base or, hell, even third base on that extra base hit that wasn't an extra base hit because he only got it to a single. He has said that it affects his running, that he's not even fully 100%. So here's the thing. 
I don't know why Victor Robles is out there. And it's not his fault. He's just trying to play baseball. But at the end of the day, if you're not healthy, if you're not 100%, this Nationals team needs 100% out of all nine guys in the defense. And we just can't get that out of Victor Robles at this point. And people can just void that and say, well, is 85% of Victor Robles better than Alex Call? Maybe. But also, I think we saw yesterday, if you can't stretch that hit into extra bases, if you can't catch that routine fly ball, something's wrong. You need to be down in AAA rehabbing and getting healthy. What's the point of trotting out Victor Robles if he's not 100%? And it's very noticeable that he's not 100%. Again, this is no one's fault, and it's especially not Victor Robles' fault. He just wants to play baseball. We just want to watch him play baseball. But if you're not 100% and you're missing those plays, it's going to affect the team. It's going to affect Mackenzie Gore's stats. It's going to affect what he does, how he approaches at bats. That's not good. And while his bat seems to be working just fine, the fact that he can't run at the way that he used to because of this injury and that he's still not 100%, then what's the point of trotting him out there yet again for this team that doesn't really need to win right now? That part just doesn't really make sense to me. So that's something to keep an eye on with Victor Robles because it is a little bit of a concern, the fact that he's not 100% still, and we're still putting him out there. We got nothing to lose to so stick him on the bench and have Alex Call come up and play center field again because he did a great job in center defensively. Now the bat, it needs some work. But again, I need someone who's 100% out there. And no one should blame Victor Robles. No one should blame Davey. They need to win games. They felt like Victor Robles is going to help them the most. They made that decision. But at the end of the day, they're now going to have to wait 10 days for Alex Call for them to recall him. So you'd have to call someone else up and then do whatever you would have to do. The Nationals play the Cardinals today at 4.05 Eastern time. You can catch that and every pitch of the Nats hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. We're going to preview this game, but even then, it's a little bit iffy if this, if this game will actually go on tonight. I'll discuss that just right after this. And now we get into it as the Nationals take on the Cardinals to try to avoid the series sweep. And again, the Nationals have lost five games here in this last week or so. They got swept by the Marlins, and now they're in danger of getting swept by the St. Louis Cardinals. Listen, after May, my expectations were sky high for this team. My expectations were they were going to win maybe 70 games. But right now, as we sit here today, June 21st, we are now on track for about 100 losses in this 2023 season. Let's get this out of the way. This was probably the expectation heading into this season. Simple as that. If you didn't think that, God bless your soul. I wish I had your confidence. But also, here's the big issue is that we got a taste of success. We saw what this team could do and what they can do if they are consistent as they almost won 50% of their games in May. But with that said, now we start to see the flip side of the issues as the bullpen has gotten a little steadier over the last week, as the offense has gotten a little bit more pedestrian over the last week. It's one problem, then it's the next, and then it's the next. This team has to find a steady line of solid bullpen relief, good starting pitching, relatively good offensive numbers. But also, I think the unfair thing is to have expectations of this team to be a winning ball club. We're fans. I'm a fan. I want this team to win every single day. There's no point in tanking anymore in Major League Baseball with the way the lottery is and the way these new draft rules are, which are so stupid, by the way. There's no point in the tank. I want to see these guys win. I want to see C.J. Abrams develop. I want to see Kiba Ruiz take that next step. That is what I want to see. In the Nationals, as of right now, you start to see the immaturity of the players, not the personalities of them, the baseball players. 
the guys who haven't really fully developed and are continuing to develop in the major leagues. Because you have guys like Abrams who have hit some rough patches. Kiebert Ruiz, who has stepped it up a little bit over the last few weeks. You see these different things every single day. And that is going to continue as that is part of the growing pains of a rebuilding baseball team or really any sport that you look at and that you enjoy to watch. So as the Nationals do get on to take on this St. Louis Cardinals team today, just keep in the back of your mind that when you have Trevor Williams going against Miles Michaelis, that is a pretty tough pitching matchup. And while the numbers really haven't showed it this year, having a 4-3-6 ERA for Michaelis, Trevor Williams himself has a 4-5 ERA. This isn't really the look into your eight ball and have the future there for this Nationals team. It's simply not as that. But we'll just have to see as they continue to go on. So thank you for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast. I'll catch you guys on the flip side. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one, Nats fans.